Sandrine. Y'all can say hi, Sandrine.
Yeah, that's good times. Thank you, band, um, for helping us with that. Well, over the past 20 years, thank you, Mike, uh, I've been in the process of uprooting and extracting seeds of racism that had were planted in my heart when I was young. And I remember one of the instances that really escalated this issue in my life was when I was in high school and I was a new Christ follower and I invited one of my black friends to the church that I was attending at the time. And, you know, it was kind of cool that Ronnie came and then he began a relationship with Christ and it was kind of cool to watch Ronnie be baptized in our church and it seemed like everything was going well and everybody kind of seemed to be accepting Ronnie into the church but then things went south when Ronnie started dating one of the white girls in the church and I found myself in the pastor's office like in trouble and I didn't understand why and I sat in the office of a man with an earned doctorate degree that I respected and he was telling me from the Bible that Ronnie should not be dating Diana one of the white girls in the church. Now, there are some times in life when we have a lot on our plate, right? And we don't have room for more issues on our plate or more stuff to do. And so we just kind of turn our heads and look the other way from something that's staring us in the face. You know what I mean? But this was not one of those things where I could turn my head. Then some years later, I was going to school and I was in seminary and uh, my wife and I started a ministry in the inner city of Fort Worth where I was going to school and I was working there as a bus driver while I was getting through school. And um, the ministry that we were involved with, uh, basically everyone there was either black or Hispanic except for my wife and I. And I remember a conversation I was having with one of my black friends there. She was wearing a shirt that said, it's a black thing you wouldn't understand. And I said, well, help me understand. What, what don't I understand? And I sat there with a group of my black friends, and they gave me an education on the subtle and sometimes not so subtle racism that they experience regularly in their lives. And again, because these are my friends, I can't turn my head from this issue and just blow it off. And I think that this is partly what Peter felt when God was telling him, you can't turn your head from this issue, particularly in your relationship with a guy by the name of Cornelius. And I want to take you to the Bible for just a minute in Acts chapter 10. Look at verse 15. And the context of this is when God had sent Peter into the home of a man from another race named Cornelius. And here's what the scripture says. But the voice spoke again. He's like, Peter, do not call something unclean if God has made it to be clean. Did you catch that? He's speaking of a Gentile person, a person who is not of the same race as Peter. Don't call this man clean if God made him clean. Look at Acts 10, 28, just a few verses later. Peter told them, he's talking to this group of people, he says, you know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But check this part out. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean you see that the transformation that Peter's going through in his thinking he wouldn't he grew up thinking I shouldn't even go into the home of a man of this other race a Gentile but now God is changing his heart changing his viewpoint and look a few verses later in Acts chapter 10 verse 34 then Peter replied I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism Did you catch that no favoritism in every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the viewpoint of God from the Bible. Now, I love City Church because we have all different kinds of people in this room. You know, um, I've got one friend in our church from West Africa. I've got another friend that I see right down here named Habib because um, his family came here. Uh, from, I guess, Asia Minor, Turkey. Um, I see people of all different backgrounds here. Some of you are military. Others of you are like more pacifists, right? Um, and we come together and get along. I know people here who are teachers and 
coaches and people in the medical industry and people um, of every different age, race, and walk of life. We all come from different backgrounds together here, don't we? Some people here have a background of having been in prison. Other people have never been in prison in their lives or never associated with anyone like that. Some of us come from backgrounds of drugs and alcohol and sexual addictions and struggles. Some people have come to faith in Christ from a background of having believed in reincarnation. Others say, hey, yeah, I'm going to mix my reincarnation with Christianity so I can get saved in every lifetime I live, right? <laughs> um, some people come from backgrounds of, of like cults. Others come from spiritual backgrounds of like the occult or Satanism. And then others have come from really, really dark backgrounds like Methodists, Baptists, and um, Presbyterians, and even some of you naughty Catholics, you know, because you know that your grandmother would really get mad at you if she knew you missed mass to come here, right? She would lay that blanket of guilt all over you like grandmas can do. But our church, we may be better than most at um, accepting a diverse range of people, but I believe that we still have room to grow. And today as we celebrate the work of Martin Luther King, I'm, encourage, I'm encouraging everyone here to consider never turning your head and ignoring these issues of subtle racism and the like. Because today, uh, I come having prepared this talk. Last week, I was looking on the internet to prepare, and I actually went to the KKK website. And here's what I read on that site. It said, we're bringing a message of hope and deliverance to, listen to these next three words, white Christian America. Now, I'm white. I've got nothing against white people, right? But there's something wrong there's something that's been filtered in the wrong way and that's not gone according to the scriptures when we hear the three words together, white, Christian, and America. The Bible is not limited to what some would call white, Christian, America. And then I found out that the director of the Klan is actually a pastor. His name's Thomas Robb. Of all people on the planet, a pastor should be the first one who knows better not to lead this type of an organization and they actually try and use the Bible to do it. So how should we respond to people who regularly practice racial profiling and hate? Well, I believe what Dr. King said that we should use grace and truth and I want to show you um, the means by which we are to respond um, on these issues uh, from Dr. King. He says, in the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. And I think that a lot of people would say, well, you know, I'm okay with people from other races and other backgrounds and the like, but I think that what gets, uh, gets people to really show you what they believe is when it comes to the watershed issue. And the watershed issue when it relates to racism is interracial marriage. In fact, some of you can remember back in 1967 when it was against the law in 16 states in the United States to intermarry. And the Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court case struck down those laws. And I want to take you back to the Old Testament just for a minute and read to you and talk about one of those verses that people will oftentimes use to try and discourage people from racially intermarrying. I'm going to take you back to Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 3 and 4 and here's the one of the ones that's commonly used. It says there, do not intermarry with them and don't let your daughters and sons marry their sons and daughters. They will lead your young people away from me to worship other gods. Now that phrase at the very end, they will lead your young people away from me to worship other gods is very important to the context here. And that clearly establishes that what's being spoken of here has nothing to do with skin color or race, but it's an incompatible spirituality. Another thing about the context that we all have to understand is that this is God speaking to Jewish people about Gentile people. You know who Gentile people are? Probably the majority of us in this room. Unless you're Jewish, you're a Gentile, okay? And so it's clear to me 
that this is not about skin color or race, but it's really referring to an incompatible spirituality. And uh, when, when both the parties in a relationship are Christ followers, what God does is this amazing thing, is that he breaks down all the barriers that would have kept us apart. And even today, I think it's wise for people to consider the spirituality of the other person before you go into a relationship. Because if Christ is the most important person in your life and you marry someone who does not believe that Christ is important, um, then that's going to inevitably cause problems and discord in the relationship. But I want to take you to Galatians for just a minute and we can see the unity that we can have in Christ. Galatians 3, 27 and 28, where Paul says, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have been made like him. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all Christians. You are one in Christ Jesus. So Paul makes it very clear here in the New Testament that it's okay that we're all one in Christ when we believe in Christ. It doesn't matter the racial background and interracial marriage was really nothing new in the New Testament it's been around for a long time in the Bible and I want to take you back to a mixed marriage of Moses and his Cushite wife and I was helped by a pastor John Piper who is a former racist and came to understand a new theology of diversity from the Bible now I want to take you to the book of Numbers in the Old Testament just for a minute because when Moses married a woman from another race, he got criticism from his family. Some of you know what that feels like, right? So I want to take you there just for a minute in Numbers chapter 12 verse 1. And it says, while they were at Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron, Miriam's Moses' sister, um, and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. Now let's go back and look for just a minute. What is a Cushite woman? I mean, some of you say, hey, is my, is my woman ages? She's getting a little Cushite, you know, around, around the waist there. Um, that's not what he's talking about there. But uh, a Cushite woman is a woman from the land of Cush. Now, where is Cush? Cush is where modern-day Ethiopia is. Just out of curiosity, what color are people from Ethiopia? You tell me. Black. Is it okay to say it? Black, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, that's the color of a person uh, from the land of Cush. So Moses had a black wife. Now, how does God respond to Miriam and Aaron when they are criticizing Moses about his black wife? Look at Numbers chapter 12, verse 9. It says, the Lord was furious with them. And he departed as the cloud moved from above the tabernacle. Miriam suddenly became white as snow with leprosy. So if your relatives criticize your interracial marriage, just pray, yeah, God send leprosy on them right now. Right? You know what I mean? But it's almost as if God is saying, hey, you don't like this marriage? You want to criticize this? You like white? I'll give you white. I'll give you white leprosy on your skin unless you think that black is always a metaphor for sin and evil in the Bible here's a clear reference to which white is something that God uses the white of leprosy is something that is unclean God would not turn his head on this issue and here's the deal is that there's no place as I've looked around the world there's no place where interracial marriage is discouraged and the groups live with equal respect, honor, and opportunity. It can't exist. Because when what happens is, is when you get kids together, kids of different colors, if you let them get together, they will fall in love. And they will get married. And they will have relationships. But what happens in countries and in cultures, the adults feel like they got to keep them apart, so they start creating walls. The adults will create the walls and what happens every single time is that the culture with the money and the power will always dominate and oppress the other culture and so where this comes into play for me is today I am a white man right I am mostly French English and a little bit of Cherokee Indian and I have a white daughter who I love more than my life itself and if you ask me would I encourage her to date or marry a black man a brown man, an Asian man, a Palestinian man, I would say to you first off, my daughter is not allowed to date any man, okay? <laughs> and so 
If you have children and boys, you just tell them, stay away from Pastor Doug's daughter. He is not having it, okay? But if someday God does a work in me and changes my mind, and I allow my daughter to go on a date, I want my daughter to marry a man who loves Jesus, who walks in the Spirit of God, who is not materialistic, that is compassionate to the poor, and a man that roots for our San Antonio Spurs. This is what I want for my daughter, okay? All right? So, I don't care what color he is, as long as we got Jesus and the Spurs there, we're going to be good to go, all right? Now, I want to take you to 1 Samuel for just a minute, because this is the way God sees people. 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outer appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so when it comes to this issue of interracial marriage, here's what a lot of people will say. They'll say, well, it's going to be hard on the kids. If the parents are of two different races, it's going to be hard on the kids. Well, maybe in some places it might be, but because something's hard, that doesn't make it wrong. Marriage itself is hard, but we should continue to do it, right? And here's what some people will say. Well, those kids, the reason it's going to be hard on the kids is because they're going to be half-breeds and people are going to call them half-breed. Well, here's the deal. I wish you could just go up into our children's ministry and see how beautiful some of these little half-breeds are, okay? I was just talking to Aaron Dockery about their, his little child. It's a beautiful child, you know? Um, so, you know, and, and there are people lining up at, at tanning beds, you know, to, to get that look. So um, I think it's something that is beautiful. And I believe that the Father's heart breaks over the racism in our country and around the world, and the church is really the place that should be communicating the Father's heart above all other places, and thus the church should lead the way in these issues of equality in the culture. And I know that we're, we may be ahead of most churches on this, but honestly, we do still have a ways to go on this. But one thing is certain is that we're not going to turn our heads and, and pretend like it's not there. So... Because of the prejudice that I was exposed to growing up, um, I've been inspired by a poet, and his name is Jason Carney. And Jason is a former skinhead, and he was incarcerated because of hate crimes. And while incarcerated, he learned his lessons, he changed his ways, and when he got out, he decided he wanted to do something to kind of communicate this message of acceptance and diversity. And so he does that through his poetry. I brought one of his poems that I believe really communicates what's on many of our hearts. Um, and he talks kind of fast when he does his poetry, so you'll have to kind of follow along closely. But here is Jason Carney. Take a look. My southern heritage lies in the smell of June. It was my mammal. She was half chalk tall, half snuff, half crazed by the spirit of the wind. Giving her a sense she called the touch, she could see things. Catch a firefly with a tongue. She'd rub the swollen fluorescence of their bellies to my forehead, a good vision on my birthday, and she always told me I would grow to be a man that knew life by the way it felt. That when I walked in the wandering reflection of dreams, I should stand strong and tall as Papaw because he was a man who knew life by the way it felt, and his heart was in my eyes, his soul within my breath. My southern heritage lies in their simplicity, poverty, and faith. Baseball games on an old AM radio and the closeness of a family sharing Sunday supper. My southern... Heritage was Sundays. Baptist revivals, deacons passing the altar plate, deep voices from the choir urging me to go tell it on the mountain because Jesus Christ is Lord. And I love that old hymn. But I can't think about those fond memories of childhood anymore without seeing through the pessimism of these eyes, which are of a man. And I have to ask myself, what kind of truth those old white Southern Baptists found on those mountaintops? Why couldn't they hear the voices dangling from the branches of the elms of death that had been peeled away into the forgotten generation after generation, woven into our skin, into our bones, all because they were silent? practiced it turning their heads their heritage lies in the shades of my skin it's twisted and scarred worn by their words colored negro and nigger so why don't we go find the truth on the mountaintop that says my southern heritage came clothed in white sheets and allows a rebel flag to hang this very day over the capital of mississippi my southern heritage spends centuries of time where people are silent and practiced it turning their heads see we're the threads of rope that pulled james bird to his death along the back roads of jasper texas Less than 200 miles from where I live, ignorance reigns. My southern heritage spans centuries of time. 
where people are silent, practiced it, turning their heads. It boils under my skin when my eyes don't have heart, when my soul's not in my breast. See, if I'm to grow to be that man that knows life by the way it feels, then these lessons got to be mine to see the truth of and find the responsibility to teach to my little girl. Because I don't want her southern heritage lying in the shades of her skin. She's half Thai, half Irish, Choctaw, and snuff. She will speak in multicultural phrases combining Thai, Laotian, and Hick. Sabadi Kai, y'all. And I'm gonna catch fireflies with my tongue. Rub the swollen fluorescence of their bellies to her forehead. A good vision on her birthday. Well, she will travel amongst the dead and learn the lessons of their lives. Spill the dust of stars and planets. Exist in the deepest reaches of the mind. She will tell the truth on that mountaintop. But she will not succumb to the wounds of a bone. She will not be silent. And she will not ever be practiced at turning her head. Peace after all. I like what Jason was doing because with his words, he was painting a picture of the dream or of the vision for equality in the world. And, you know, that's really an old dream. It's been around for a long time. And God used his prophet Isaiah to speak of it. And I want to take you just for a minute to Isaiah's, um, I guess, picture or vision of the kingdom where God says in Isaiah 56, 6, I will also bless the what? Foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord. I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. And he goes on to say, my temple will be called a house of prayer for what? All the nations, right? And then many years later, Martin Luther King would stand up and speak this message of equality here in his I have a dream speech and I wanted to quote some of that he says I have a dream that my children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character and when we let freedom ring when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet from every state and every city we will be able to speed up the day when all God's children black men and white men Jews and Gentiles Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. And that is a vision of God's kingdom that he's bringing to earth. And that's part, partly what we're trying to do here through our church is to give glimpses or pictures of the kingdom of God and what's going on there. So for this next part of the service, I'm going to need your help. I need you to stand up with me if you would and join hands with people next to you on either side. And we're going to read a text together, and I'm going to give you some special instructions later on in this text. But we're going to be reading of this vision or picture of what's going on in heaven right now. And it says in Revelation 7, 9, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb, that's Jesus, and they were clothed in white and held palm branches in their hands and they were shouting with a mighty shout. So when we read this next part, I want you to help uh, say it with me. I'm not just going to say it by myself. And when you say this part, I need you to like put on your outdoor voices. Can you do that? Because this is like not a Presbyterian church at all, okay? So I need you to be kind of loud in this and like say it as if you were at a Cowboys game and they were actually winning or like even making a first down, okay? So here we go. Do you guys understand the instruction? So when I point to you, we're going to say these words together. Ready? Salvation comes from our God on the throne and from the Lamb. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing together. Yeah. Good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You are 
are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you, who you are, we worship you, hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you. Okay, uh, go ahead and take a seat for just a minute, and uh, man, thank you guys, band. You know, you guys should play every week. I really enjoy the music <laughs> here. It's, it's really good. Um, and thank you guys for kind of playing along with my little, you know, audience participation things. You know, I think that you really made the experience great. So thanks, and there are a couple of things I need to make you aware of before we all take off. 